my name is Amy King, and it's great to have you here uh, with us for the second uh, in our China Development and International Order Seminar Series. Um, we kicked off our, our se series a few weeks ago um, with our first seminar by Xiaoyu Lu, uh, and thanks to many of you uh, who attended that one. Um, as I said at the time, um, we were with this seminar, we're sort of hoping to sort of bring together scholars thinking about how China is shaping ideas and practices of development, both historically uh, and in the contemporary period. And that's sort of animated, I guess, by our um, thinking and my own kind of, I guess, argument that development has always been very much at the centre of big contests over international order. Um, and China has both been a sort of a recipient of many of those um, contests, but also increasingly uh, shaping of them as well. And so one of the things we want to try and do with this series is, is bring together a range of IR scholars, historians, political economists, um, political anthropologists, as a, in the case of Xiaoyu, um, to sort of think about this question in, in a range of different ways. Um, so we'll be doing that over the course of, of this year. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the uh, lands of the first Australians um, and to pay my respect to elders past and present. Um, before I um, say anything further, um, I think the most important thing I'd, I'd really like to do um, now is to um, welcome our chair for the seminar, Professor Wes Widmeyer, known to many of you, Professor of International Political Economy here uh, in the Bell School and in the IR department, um, who's very kindly agreed to, to chair the seminar today. And I think Wenting and I could think of no better person than Wes to, to really reflect on what we're attempting to do with this paper. Um, given his own longstanding interest in, in ideas and the evolution of, of economic policy ideas uh, at moments of both, you know, crisis and change, um, and to think about how we might trace that, you know, over time. Um, also, I've learned this morning that that uh, that Wes is uh, renowned in many other ways. Uh, he snapped, uh, snapped, uh, snapped some Taylor Swift tickets last night. So he's not only a professor of IPE, but also <laughs> dad of the year in his household. So uh, he's, uh, yeah, that comes very highly uh, accomplished to us here. Um, so thank you very much, Wes. I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, they say uh, don't strive for happiness, strive for contentment. And I, <laughs> this morning I'm happy. I'll have a secure Taylor Swift ticket. And I'm happy to be here, um, and I'm happy to hear this this great um, paper and presentation um, from two leading, um, you know, IR and, and China studies scholars, um, Amy King and Wen Ting Hei. Um, just to introduce briefly, um, so we know, you know, the the, the, the accomplishments. Um, Amy received her PhD in IR from Oxford University, where she studied as a Rhodes Scholar. Her doctoral thesis was awarded Oxford's 2013. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Jen. <laughs> okay. it's not an easy one a memorial <laughs> memorial award um and in 2017 she won the academy of social sciences in australia's paul burke award for early career researchers that contained outstanding achievements in the social sciences um she has more grants than i can list i think um the westpac research fellowship and odecra um which is supporting this research her book as a scholar um china japan relations after world war ii empire industry and war uh, 1949-1971 with Cambridge is, is a brilliant work on, on uh, post-World War II Japan-China um, relations, um, and, you know, just empirically amazing uh, substantive research and theoretically very cutting edge. So this work continues in that tradition. Um, Wen Ting Hei in the Department of International Relations is working on her PhD. Um, her interest, her research interest revolves around crises as mechanisms that drive change in, 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 in institutional policies. And her PhD project, of which I'm the supervisor, so I obviously like it and think it's important, uh, is to investigate how China's policy interests um, in reforming the international monetary system um, have, since 1997, been reshaped across a series of economic crises that we're all familiar with. Um, and so seeing the two of them working together on, on an article on a paper like this, which um, is just, just so incredibly rich and will come out, I'm sure, in a major journal at some point, um, is, is really exciting. And so we're all getting a, a preview into some really important work here. So I turn it over to our good colleagues. Well, thanks very much, Wes. Um, could, you could leave the door open slightly. Oh, that's right. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, thanks for, so much for that really generous introduction well, and, well. and great to have you here. Um, <laughs> this building always makes, <laughs> makes it easy to, to work in. Um, so I'm going to kick us off uh, today and, and talk for sort of the first part and then hand over to Wenting, who's going to, to get into the second half of the paper and presentation. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose from the outset, Wenting and I 
we're really interested, I guess, in the last few years at the increasing references to zili gongsheng or self-reliance um, in Chinese uh, political discourse, in academic research uh, by, you know, by Xi Jinping, but also, you know, in, in, in sort of political discourse, newspapers, media, et cetera, around him particularly in the wake of growing tensions in the US-China relationship and, and trade decoupling, um, but also, you know, following the crisis in Ukraine and, and, and more talk about sort of self-sufficiency uh, in, in various aspects of the Chinese economy. And we were not the only ones, I suppose, interested in this, this sort of seeming return to the idea of self-reliance um, and, and a wide range of, you know, of Western commentary um, in, you know, major newspapers and um, and, and by very seasoned um commentators on China, people like Ian Johnson, et cetera, writing in foreign affairs, sort of pointing to this, this return of this, of this trope and, and, and arguing that it perhaps signals a return to the insular economic policies of the Mao era. And I think on the one hand, you know, there, there, there certainly has been uh, a degree of isolationism under Xi and a closing down of, of China, not least um, following COVID-19. But we instinctively could also point to lots of ways in which China was trying to deepen its economic and other forms of engagement with the wider world, perhaps not the Western world, but, but certainly other parts of that world. And then when I thought back to my own kind of earlier work on, on China in the 1950s and 60s, an idea, at a point when, when Zili Gongsheng was again very, very strong in, in Chinese political discourse under Mao, it's also a time when uh, China is very much opening up economically, um, albeit in small ways and certainly not compared to, to Deng Xiaoping, but certainly tolerating and actually encouraging quite profound economic interdependence with countries like Japan. And, and my own work has been very much um, kind of, uh, you know, other historians of the Mao era, economic historians of Mao era have, have sort of more recently published much more widely on this period, and showing that's not only happening with Japan, but the wider capitalist world as well. So we were kind of interested in the tension baked into this idea of self-reliance. You know, yes, autonomy, yes, self-sufficiency to some degree, but also coexisting with a, with a good deal of interdependence. And we weren't the first to note that. Um, a number of other historians and, and political scientists, political economists, particularly in the kind of post writing in the post-reform era, 1990s, 2000s, sort of looking at this wave of openness under Deng Xiaoping, begin to sort of say, well, hang on, has self-reliance been abandoned or not? And, and, and many of them came down, I think, on the point that, that perhaps some of the core features of this idea uh, had continued. And maybe it's not necessarily um, an idea that narrowly means autarky. So we're not the first to, to make that point. Uh, and others have suggested that maybe it's better understood as a spectrum or a disposition or an attitude of mind, you know, these are some of the terms that we we, we tend to see um, in that literature on self-reliance. So for us, I guess, as a question, of, and one of the things we want to try and do in this paper is, is, is sort of ask whether or not the idea of self-reliance today means the same thing that it did in the past, and how might we actually go about tracing this? Um, and, you know, what, if it is a, a resilient idea, what actually explains that, you know, what's doing the work in explaining why uh, and how this idea has remained a resilient one. This is a kind of risky endeavour, though, um, and one of the things we've been sort of, I guess, concerned about from the start with this paper is that it can be quite dangerous to try and trace ideas over time and, and assume that words mentioned at one point in time mean the same thing as another. Um, and we don't want to kind of risk boiling down a very complicated concept that exists in a particular historical concept and moment um, to some kind of abstracted or, you know, partial uh, idea and sort of trying to find it where we see it. Um, that's what we're trying to avoid doing, and we, we hope we manage to do that. But the inherent challenge in this is, is trying to capture that, um, I guess, historical uh, granularity and detail um, across a wide swathe of time. And, and can you do that in a paper length, you know, article? Um, and, you know, that's something that we're we're keen to hear feedback on, I suppose. Um, so this is, you know, a very much a work in prog uh, progress. And so we're keen to sort of hear what resonates uh, or not with you. To try and um, attempt this um, and sort of thinking about what might explain the resilience of this idea over time, we've turned in particular to, to literature within the IPE field by in particular some uh, thinking done by discursive institutionalists 
who were really, I guess, responding to a big um, debate within IPE over sort of agency structure, a bit familiar to many fields, but uh, in this context about what explains um, institutional um, change or stability, I suppose. And, and what had traditionally, I suppose, defined that field was a sense of we have long periods of stability punctuated by very great change at moments of crisis. But along come a group of scholars sort of in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, and making the argument that actually we might see much, uh, we, we do see much more evidence of incremental change. It's not just crisis provoke, you know, prompting uh, major change and then stability for a long period of time, but actually we're seeing incremental change in you know various issue areas, um, even at times of stability. Uh, some scholars pointed to the agency of, kind of pur purposeful actors in in facilitating that incremental change, and then others, the particularly these this group of discursive institutionalists, people like Vivian Schmidt, um, uh, pointed in particular to the content uh, and structure of an idea. Um, as as helping to facilitate uh, that incremental change and making the argument that um, ideas that have particular characteristics, which I'll come to in a moment, might help to facilitate actors' ability to interpret those ideas in a range of different ways, um, leading subsequently to incremental change. So Schmidt and Thatcher um, working as they were on the kind of the resilience of the idea of neoliberalism across um, time and space um, across Europe and beyond and across over time, defined ideational resilience uh, in the way up there. An idea's ability to endure, recur or adapt over time, to predominate against rivals and to survive uh, despite its own many failures. And they, I suppose importantly, suggest that ideational resilience is not the same thing as ideational continuity and they're sort of careful to distinguish that. So whereas continuity is, is effectively saying this is an idea that is stable and unchanging, ideational resilience does allow for some kind of changes around the margins, if you like, um, and some incremental change within a core sort of more fixed set of elements. Um, so it's a more, I guess, a bit more of a flexible uh, concept. And the features that they particularly pointed to in their work on neoliberalism um, were that an idea that was defined by more ambiguous, uh, fuzzy, general, plastic uh, content uh, that perhaps had some internal incoherence, you know, in sort of tension between different aspects of the idea. Um, and at that sort of degree of conceptual fuzziness was more likely to be a resilient one. Um, because it could be open to diverse interpretations. Everyone could sort of say, yeah, we're following these core elements, but we're you know, interpreting them in our own way. Um, a more general plastic idea could be applicable to different circumstances uh, and different uh, historical contexts. And also it gave political actors quite a bit of um, legitimacy to operate. So it could give policymakers quite a large menu of possible policies that all could be said to flow from that original idea. Um, many things can be described as neoliberal, for instance, and many different kind of policy options. Um, it, would, it could allow political actors to pursue quite different interpretations of a core idea without having to criticise their predecessors. And as we're going to sort of argue, that's pretty significant and quite important in, in China. Um, and similarly, um, political actors could come along and say, well, we're incorporating other perhaps even contradictory elements um, into this central idea. Um, and that's a way to sort of neutralize political attacks. So we're, we're embedding a lot of potentially quite broad uh, or potentially even contradictory elements of an idea into one sort of central core. So it gives policymakers some tools to play around with. So what we wanted to do, I guess, in this paper and sort of coming back to that idea of really placing this idea in its particular historical context was to understand how Chinese elites themselves have understood um, have, uh, and articulated the idea of self-reliance um, over three key eras. Um, and what we wanted to try and do is sort of to look at that discourse and how it was used in practice. Um, and to, to understand how um, Chinese elites at, the, at, at, these, at these various moments kind of understood the different elements of those ideas. And what we find is that there are, I guess, three interlocking pillars um, that we see featured 
perhaps to varying extents, but, but broadly um, consistently across these three eras. And that self-reliance contains these three interlocking pillars, autonomy, interdependence, uh, and order shaping. And these three pillars have, have coexisted with one another. Um, they've sat in tension in some cases with one another, but that tension's been accepted, I suppose, or acknowledged or tolerated, if you like. Um, and then certain of these pillars, and particularly the order shaping pillar, has often been used to try and accommodate some of that tension, uh, where the tensions become sort of unsustainable, for instance, or unmanageable. And so what we want to argue in this paper is that tripartite structure um, has enabled Chinese leaders, we argue since the Republican era, so um, I'll come back to that in just a moment, uh, to reinterpret and, and usefully deploy the idea of self-reliance, uh, both in terms of China's domestic economic um, policy, but it's it more and perhaps more significantly its relations with the outside world. So I'm going to say a little bit about the origins of the idea uh, in China and those that tripartite structure, and then I'll hand over to Wen Ding, Wen Ding, who's going to get into the kind of the Deng Xiaoping and beyond era, and then uh, Xi Jinping today before um, giving some conclusions. So we situate the origins of the idea of self-reliance um, and that tripartite structure um, broadly in sort of the 1930s to 1960s. Um, many, much scholarship, and many of you may be aware that the idea of self-reliance is typically associated with Mao Zedong um, and an idea that emerges kind of in the Yan'an era, um, which I'll get to in just a moment. We, however, find evidence uh, of, of China's Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, also using this idea of self-reliance, perhaps not surprisingly, um, because it's an idea that, that really, uh, even if the terminology wasn't necessarily used, um, certainly had its legacy in earlier generations of Chinese um, uh, intellectuals uh, and leaders, and really kind of in the wake of the Opium Wars um, and the self-strengthening movement in China, sort of an, art an identification that that China needed to keep the initiative for change in its own hands, that too much of China's fate uh, was being defined in particular by imperial powers who were able to control large swathes of China's territory um, and, and who were making China's economy highly dependent on more advanced, uh, in increasingly industrialised Western powers and, and then Japan. And so there was a recognition really from the 19th century onwards that, that China needed to obtain advanced infrastructure, uh, sorry, advanced, advanced technology and industrial uh, infrastructure, industrial capacity, if it was to achieve that kind of um, autonomy uh, and independence on the world stage. And so those two things were very much linked. And that's, you know, an idea that's been, um, you know, very clearly articulated in a, in a range of literature. In the 1930s, though, the idea um, begins to then really be articulated um, by, by, by both the CCP um, and the Kuomintang. For the CCP, the idea um, is very, very much comes to the fore um, in, two, in two ways. Um, the autonomy pillar of self-reliance, the sense of needing to rely on one's own initiative um, or regeneration through one's own efforts, which is sort of a literal translation for the term, sort of comes up. Comes to, uh, um, it comes up in particular in, in Yan'an, the CCP is sort of forced to, to move into China's northeast, sorry, northwest, and uh, is blockaded economically by the Kuomintang. And so it has no choice but to survive um, that geographic and economic isolation through its own initiative. Um, however, the Kuomintang is also beginning to think through these ideas, um, although we think probably the term itself of Zili Gangsang isn't used, at least, you know, we haven't found clear evidence of that term in the 1930s. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment. There is lots of discussion by um, China's key economic, the Kuomintang's sort of key economic thinkers, uh, Wang Jingwei, Chen Gongbo and others uh, in the 1930s about the need to overcome dependency. Uh, on foreign powers, and in particular uh, on Japan, um, and of the need to sort of develop a, a policy of national autarky or self-sufficiency um, and transform China's rural economy um, into a consumer market uh, for goods produced in the sort of more advanced parts of the economy rather than looking to foreign markets. So sort of transformation and sort of knitting together of the rural and coastal economies. But from the very start, from the earliest articulations almost of this idea, 
Self-reliance is not just defined in terms of autonomy, it's also defined in terms of interdependence uh, and the recognition that China cannot achieve that autonomy without some degree of economic contact with foreign powers. So for the Guomindang, um, and again by the 1930s, uh, sort of mid-1930s, it's about looking for ways to overcome dependence on Japan by strengthening economic interdependence with the United States, with Britain, and with the League of Nations. Um, and China's foreign finance minister at the time, Sun Tzu, and goes, you know, spends quite a bit of you know effort trying to do this. Uh, for which, you know, he's he's un unfortunately punished pretty pretty hard in the form of losing his job because the Japanese complained so bitterly about efforts to um, allow infrastructure and development assistance by by foreign Western powers in China, uh, which would sort of undermine, you know, Japan's own influence and presence there. Um, so that that sense of um, interdependence as a way of overcoming dependence on any single power is quite um, a profound one uh, for the Guomindang. For the CCP, interdependence and the need to sort of rely on external economic contact with, with foreign countries uh, comes into the idea of self-reliance very early on, uh, beginning in 1937, um, after sort of the Japanese begin their first sort of um, uh, uh, major attack on um, outside of Beijing in, in the summer of 1937, which launches uh, the War of Resistance against Japan, the CCP and Guomindang form a united front. And part of the deal of that united front, as, um, as the historian Jason Kelly has, has recently shown, is that um, the Guomindang will cease their economic blockade on the CCP and provide a monthly stipend um, to the CCP to allow them to basically survive the war um, and so the CCP uses that stipend to, to buy up really essential goods, um, uh, things that they can't otherwise access within China, um, war, you know, war fighting materials, et cetera. And so Mao from the start, um, and I don't think I have this quote up here, um, I have another one in a moment to show you, but Mao from the start sort of talks about um, self-reliance as, you know, to defeat the Japanese aggressors, we should rely mainly on our own strength but we must also struggle for sympathy from England, the United States and France for our anti-Japanese resistance under conditions that do not forfeit China's territorial integrity or sovereign rights. So a recognition that you need to rely on others to some extent, but there might be conditions under which you know that, that might take place. So I think from the start, there's an understanding that we need to, we, we sort of autonomy and interdependence coexist in this idea. Uh, and there may be a need to resolve uh, or accommodate that tension um, between autonomy and interdependence. And what we see for, uh, from both uh, the Guomindang um, before its sort of opportunity to do this is truncated um, by its, its defeat in the Civil War, and then latterly by the CCP in the 1950s, is an effort, I guess, to use the international um, order as a way to perhaps help to resolve and accommodate some of those tensions. So the first um, instance, in fact, that we're aware of the Guomindang using this language of self-reliance is comes just days after the closing of the Bretton Woods Conference, which uh, the Guomindang has been heavily involved in, very actively um, participating in. Um, and an article is written in um, the state-run Zhongyang Rival, the Central Daily News, um, in July of 1944, Really, it's a very, very lengthy article titled um, on uh, international cooperation and self-reliance and trying to sort of wrestle with how you can have both of these things at the same time. Um, and as you'll see up there, you know, there's no great kind of resolution of this idea by the by the Guomindang at this moment, um, but they are kind of trying to sort of think through how this might work. On the one hand, they're very supportive of the idea of the IMF uh, and what will ultimately become the World Bank in providing the kind of financial assistance loan packages of loans um, for countries like China that are trying to badly rebuild after the war. Um, and as as um, Eric Liner and I've done a little bit of work in showing a very, you know, work very hard to try and put some goals around development into those institutions. But at the same time, you know, while they support the, the creation of these institutions, this editorial also warns that China must keep in mind that economic self-reliance is the precondition for economic cooperation. We can't receive foreign investment or advance international trade if we fail to become self-reliant. And they, the editorial sort of goes on to think, think through this relationship in quite a circular way. Uh, we can't fully participate as a, a sort of autonomous 
participants, I guess, in the international economy, unless we're first self-reliant, but we can't achieve that self-reliance unless we, um, you know, increase our imports and exports so as to sort of move down that path of industrialization. And so I think they are ultimately unable to sort of resolve that tension and they get to this idea that we, we need to help ourselves first if we want others to help us, but freedom and political independence can't be achieved without self-reliance. Um, the CCP, um, and I'll finish up here in just a couple of minutes, Wendy, and then hand over you. I've probably talked for far too long. Um, the CCP is the ultimate inheritor, though, uh, and, and I guess of, of this idea of self-reliance after 49. Um, and for them, um, again, self-reliance is really baked quite hard into their first policy blueprints when they come to power in 1949. They spend a lot of time talking about the fact that China's economy and its trade is still far too heavily dependent on kind of monopoly, monopoly imperialist capitalist powers. Um, and they inject a couple of conditions, I suppose, into what that trade should look like. We're open to trade with any power, they say, but it needs to take place on the basis of mutual equality and benefit. Um, and it needs to be heavily state controlled. Only through state control of that trade can we really ensure that it will actually benefit China rather than uh, be exploitative and ultimately be designed to, to benefit uh, foreign powers. I think they're fairly optimistic that they can achieve this, particularly with the support of the Soviet Union. Um, but of course, kind of Cold War matters come to a head. China's entry into the Korean War uh, in particular causes a major um, sort of transformation in China's economic relations with the outside world, uh, with the US and its allies uh, placing a, a very large scale, very strict economic embargo on China. And this transforms China's economic profile overnight. Um, so that, you know, prior to 1951, 52, 70% of China's trade had been taking place with the kind of the non-communist world. A year later, that's completely switched to being with the Soviet uh, bloc. And China becomes profoundly concerned about the, the, the risk of dependence on the Soviet Union. And so, you know, from the kind of the early 1950s onwards, it's looking for a way to cultivate interdependence with other countries, including with other capitalist countries, as a way to overcome that uh, overcome that dependence, uh, but that's not easy in this sort of cold world cold war context, uh, and where it's locked out of many extant international institutions. And so, what we we sort of briefly discuss in the paper is the way in which China uses a range of fora, um, the 1952 International Economic Conference in Moscow, uh, the 1954 Geneva Conference, the Bandung Conference in 1955, um, and and sort of later into into the 1960s to try and inject these ideas of mutual equality and benefit of trade between uh, Asia and African countries, not necessarily with the West as kind of a central hub and you know, these peripheral countries um, trading with it. Um, and to try and put in place some fairly sort of practical ways in which countries might um, expand their, their economic interdependence with one another um, and we can come back to this in the Q&A if people are interested in some of the kind of the, the concrete um, steps that, that China attempts to take. Um, so some, some are successful, some not so much. Um, but it certainly sees, it's certainly very active in trying to shape the international order so as to achieve that self-reliance for China uh, and uh, for that matter for, for other developing countries. I'll stop there though and hand over to, to Wen Ting to discuss the, uh, the next two kind of eras. Yeah. Thanks, Amy. Uh, from now on, I will present how self-reliance idea was resilient in Deng Xiaoping's era. After Mao Zedong passed away, Deng Xiaoping became the China's de facto leader. Deng reassessed the Chinese economy, and he drew a very different conclusion from Mao. He argues that China's cold store economic policy is unsustainable and criticizing it as an important reason for China's underdevelopment. Therefore, in December 1978, the CCP took a landmark decision to initiate reform-oriented reforms called Reform and Opening Up. On the face of it, Reform and Opening Up, which means a rapid increase of China's economic interdependence with the outside world, is contradictory to the self-reliance idea. However, Deng did not abandon the idea of self-reliance. Instead, he repeatedly emphasized his commitment to the self-reliance 
as an important part of Mao Zedong's political legacies. This is because Deng recognized the importance of venerating Mao Zedong, both to his political standing, but also the CCP standing, and both to his own political future and the CCP standing. Therefore, on the one hand, Deng emphasized the adherence to the Mao Zedong thought in the party's cardinal principles. On the other hand, to justify the transformative economic policy changes underway, Deng was opposed to blindly following whatever policies Mao had issued. So uh, instead, Deng said, China should seek the truth from facts, 实事求是, mm -hmm. and pragmatically adapt political legacies. In this light, the idea of self-reliance because of its tripartite structure that facilitated its resilience and flexibility became a very useful device for Deng Xiaoping. Specifically, Deng reinterpreted self-reliance, saying that self-reliance actually means China's ability to independently formulate its development path. So um, in Deng's words, China should commit to self-reliance and make moves according to our actual situation and our own conditions. So in this light, the reform and opening up is such a development path independently formulated by the Chinese and suitable for Chinese conditions. So it's consistent with self-reliance ideas. Furthermore, Deng highlighted the accommodation between the autonomy and interdependence pillar of self-reliance he argues that China's integration with the global market can accelerate the China's economic development and thereby build up its capacity against foreign intervention. For example, um, according to the course in the slides, uh, in 1985, Deng said, our foothold is still self-reliance, but we adopt an open policy and use the international peaceful environment to absorb more useful things for us, which is more beneficial to accelerate our development. It demonstrates that in Deng's mind, autonomy and interdependence pillar of self-reliance can coexist. And such coexistence was not only evidence in the discourse, but also in the policy practice. From 1979 to 1997, China's economic interdependence measured by the total value of imports and exports have expanded very rapidly in an annual growth or of 22%. And that period has also witnessed China's greater foreign direct investment, joint ventures, and cooperative production with the foreign firms. However, when them push very hard in the direction of interdependence, the autonomy pillar of self-reliance still plays a very important role in shaping the foundation which interdependence can take place. Indeed, Chinese leaders are very worrying about interdependence might allow foreign forces to overly penetrate Chinese economy. For example, in practice, Chinese leaders were reluctant to finance Chinese um, development through foreign debt which was viewed as a dangerous dependence. When China's economy expanded to a degree that China had to resort the foreign debt to further its economic growth, China's government was still very cautious in maintaining a conservative debt ratio to export earnings. Also, China tried very hard in maintaining an import-export balance avoiding China of being too dependent on the foreign products. The first decade of reform and opening up appeared to achieve a good balance between the autonomy and interdependence. However, very quickly, the inherent tension between these two pillars generated a crisis that became a shock to Deng's market reform agenda. As, market, as China's market more open, the domestic demands for political accountability was also growing. So in 1989, these demands culminated, uh, culminated in a large-scale student demonstration in Tiananmen Square. The party interpreted this demonstration as hostile foreign forces 
making use of China's reform policies to destabilize Chinese society with a sugar coat of democracy. Such interpretation actually points to the tension between the autonomy and interdependence. So in the following, China's leaders decided to clear the square by force if necessary. In response to the alleged human rights abuses, the US, the Europe, the Japan, and thereby imposed economic sanctions on the China. And such sanctions were so massive that caused a loss of 11 billion US dollars in China's economy. However, despite the massive costs, Deng Xiaoping does not abandon the idea of self-reliance and also not abandon interdependence. He still regards market reforms as useful mm -hmm. to accelerate the China's economic development and help China to achieve longer term political um, autonomy. Of course, such market reforms should happen in a way that limits the foreign force intervention. In this light, don't look to the international order for a solution. In September 1989, Deng aligned a vision of China's low-profile strategy, Taoguang Yanghui, in international order, referring to a non-confrontational um, foreign policy that reduces the risk of China being joined into avoidable conflicts or provoking international resistance to China's economic development. Such Taoguang Yanghui strategy was continuously adopted by Deng's successors, Zhang Zemin and Hu Jintao. They also proactively reassured China's neighbors and other major states of its peaceful intentions, introducing the very similar ideas such as new security concept, responsible great power, and peaceful rise, which all point to, all point to a low-profile stance to facilitate the simultaneous realization of autonomy and interdependence. Moreover, they continued to push hard um, forward to their market reforms regarding interdependence as a useful instrument to achieve autonomy. Self-reliance is still featured in their policy discourse as shown by the courts in the slides. So uh, in the following, I will discuss the um, how self-reliance was also resilient in Xi Jinping's era and how Xi Jinping reinterpreted the three pillars of this idea. Like Deng, when Xi Jinping became China's top leaders in 2012, he also faced the political challenge of how to deal with the previous leaders' legacies. Also, very much like Deng, she emphasized the importance of Mao Zedong's thought as a guiding principle for the party, but also made clear that the party should strategically blend the political legacies and the contemporary strategic needs. The self-reliance idea once again became a very useful rhetorical device for signaling Xi's status as a defender of Mao's legacies and party's true spirit. At the same time, because of its content and structure, self-reliance is flexible to allow Xi to reinterpret it to handle new political challenges. In this light, China's policy discourse can still display the three pillars of the self-reliance. Specifically, the autonomy pillar featured in the Xi's um, policy discourse and practice, especially in the techno technology sector. In many speeches, she argued that China could not achieve self-reliance without a greater focus on autonomous innovation, particularly in the core technologies such as those in information, biology, high-end equipment manufacturing that are now at the forefront of economic competition. Look at the report in the slide. This is what she argued in his speech in 2016. He said, no matter how large an internet company is or how high its market value, if its core components are heavily dependent on the foreign countries, the vitality of its supply chains are in the hands of others. This is like building a house on the base of someone else's foundations. No matter how big or beautiful that house is, 
when the wind and rain comes, it will collapse at the first blow. So for Xi Jinping, it's dangerous that China depended on the high technologies of foreign companies. Therefore, she initiated a set of industrial policies to reduce China's reliance on the foreign technology supply chains, such as made in China 2025. Such pursuit was further amplified when China-US economic relations got worse from 2018 and Trump imposed tariffs on China. She commented it in the court here, saying that it's becoming increasingly difficult to obtain advanced technology um, in the world, and the unilateralism and trade protectionism are on the rise, forcing China to take the road of self-reliance. However, when Xi emphasizes technological self-reliance, he has made clear that self-reliance could not achieved in isolation. Similar to Deng, Xi said only by opening up can China realize modernization. In practice, China indeed still actively engage with the open flows of high technology goods and knowledge. For example, in 2021, when the European Parliament freezes the ratification of EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, China has very actively stepped in and lobbied the EU to revive the deal, which could have facilitated EU-China investment and technology exchanges in many sectors, such as biological uh, resources and the telecommunication services. China has also facilitated digital trade and investment with ASEAN through several mechanisms, and the latest example being the upcoming third phase of ASEAN-China free trade area, which will target digital economy green economies, and supply chain integration. Of course, China's economic engagement is not unlimited. It's still conditioned by the perceived tension between autonomy and interdependence. During Xi's administration, there are emerging uncertainties such as US-China trade war, Ukraine crisis, COVID-19, that further uh, require the further actions to ease up such tension. Therefore, she has sought to shape a more beneficial international order for China's economic development, particularly by strengthening China's connectivity with the global South. One example is China's efforts to reform the international monetary order. China has a very long-standing disagreement with the dollar-centered monetary order, at least since the Asian financial crisis. So China criticized this order is too much depending on the major reserve currencies, especially the US dollar. And the order is very vulnerable to this country's, um, the currency issuing country's economic conditions and sovereign interests. These concerns became very stronger after global financial crisis. And in Xi's administration, China was very hard to diversify reserve currencies to minimize exchange risks and dollar liquidity shortage. One way to achieve this is to strengthen non-Western monetary cooperation networks, such as through the mechanisms like Shanghai Cooperation Organization and BRICS. By now, China has successfully signed bilateral currency swap agreements with more than 40 countries and regions. Beyond the monetary realm, Xi's administration has also devoted to order-shaping pillar through more comprehensive economic strategies. The most well-known effort could be the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, established in 2013, and which is a cornerstone of China's efforts to cultivate international order conditions more favorable to the China's economic development. On the one hand, BRI's strategy can facilitate the China's interdependence with the global market as it claims to achieve connectivity of policy, infrastructure, trade, financial, and people-to-people. -people. On the other hand, BRI is also part of China's pursuit for economic autonomy. For example, when she visited domestic companies, he encouraged these companies to seize the opportunity brought by BRI, build up their manufacturing capacity to help China's commitment to self-reliance 
in the face of rising unilateralism and protectionism. Therefore, BRI embraces the seemingly contradictory pillar of autonomy and interdependence. Also, as an order building effort, it shapes an international environment more receptive to the China's interests, thereby alleviating the China's fear of being overly exposed to a West-dominated international order. So far, it's all about our story regarding how separate lines idea from 1930s to nowadays, almost one century. So, so far, what conclusions and implications can we take away from this paper or our research? Firstly, our paper highlights the ambiguities of China's policy ideas. That is, China's policy ideas can be interpreted in a different ways. When Xi Jinping frequently mentioned self-reliance, many international observers are likely to literally interpret self-reliance as self-sufficiency for autarky and thereby overrate Xi's interest in economic isolationism. However, according to our research, self-reliance can be interpreted in different ways and justify a very wide range of ec economic policy um, possibilities across Mao, Deng, Hu, Jiang, and Xi's era. Therefore, to better understand Chinese economic interests, we must pay attention to the more specific China's discourse under the umbrella of self-reliance. Such analytical portion is particularly important in researching China, a country under the exclusive leadership of CCP, and where leaders face the constant challenges of how to adjust their policies in responding to the changing context without criticizing the past leaders too harshly. In this light, ambiguous policy ideas and discourse became a very useful and common device for Chinese leaders. Secondly, our paper highlights the importance of unpacking an idea's content and structure to help us understand, better understand how the idea can shape different interests. The constructivist IP literature has highlighted the importance of ideas in socially constructing the different interests. But the research that closely examines an idea's content and structure is far from enough. In this paper, we have highlighted how the ambiguous content and inconsistent structure of self-reliance idea shape its potential to accommodate a very wide range of economic policy um, possibilities. Speaking of the inconsistent structure, we unpack the paradoxical relations between the autonomy and interdependence, which can be both contradictory and at the same time accommodative to each other, and also unpack the often overlooked pillar of order shaping. They are all inside the self-reliance idea. It's such structure that allows self-reliance ideas to be resilient in China's policy discourse despite of the transformative economic, political, and strategic context. Third, such struggles for self-reliance or the struggles over how to cope with the autonomy and interdependence or the shaping are not limited in the Chinese context. Look at the international politics nowadays. More countries, including the EU and US, are seeking for the economic autonomy and always say trying to reduce the over-dependence on other countries' supply chain. Under the framing such as decoupling, de-risking, French shoring. So our paper suggests that such pursuit for the autonomy does not necessarily mean deglobalization. And just like China's pursuit for autonomy can potentially accommodate with economic engagement. Also, we suggest that the order shaping can be a useful solution to accommodate such tension sometimes and to ease up the widespread state sphere of possible vulnerability generated by the globalization. 